say a little bit about how this came about. Uh, I think it was back in June or July, I was having a peaceful cup of coffee up at Monty's, and Dennis Barris, who I've gotten to know over the years, came up to me and said, would you be interested in just meeting with our historical society and talk a little bit about the Jones event? And so I said, oh yeah, that sounds okay to me. And now I've been somewhat surprised that it has grown to what we're doing here today. So again, that's how it all came about. I'm really glad you're here. I'm really glad you're interested in learning about Kurt Jones. I'm also kind of surprised that so many people got up so early to come and listen to us two old guys. You know? <laughs> um, I know you all know Bill. He's an icon in the community. And probably one thing you didn't know was that he was also the president of the class of 1950 out of Verona High School. So that's a long standing thing. <laughs> Again, less known and certainly less famous, I'm Will Schmidt, and also a graduate of 1950 from Rona High School. Our job today is to properly recognize and honor the life and the achievements of Kurt Jones. I hope we do justice to the task. I would like to recognize some people central to our discussion. We are so honored. We have Jackie. Where is Jackie? Jacqueline? There she is. Stand up, Jackie. <laughs> Jacqueline Ochtenberg Jones Zebley. So, again, we're so happy you're here, Jackie, and we've enjoyed our meetings. Um, Jackie now lives in Virginia roughly in the same community as her three children, Dan, Dave, and Lori. Um, I first met them about two years ago when we were involved in working on the commemorative thing for uh, Kirk. Um, we met at the ladies and I found them to be very delightful people. So please take the time to, to uh, visit with Jackie. I would also like to recognize Dennis Barris. Where's Dennis? We can blame this all on yeah, Dennis. <laughs> He's past president of the school board. He was instrumental in bringing about the recognition effort of two years past. Arlene Pulver. Where are you? There you are. Arlene. And she kept our nose to the task over about a two year period. Russ Dalton, over there, yeah. a valuable source of history, and we were out together. And there were other people too, but again, those are the people who have been recognized today. We are here to talk about a fellow graduate, a man who led a remarkable life, Kurt Jones. We are going to remember the dedication of the athletic complex in his honor on October 14th of 1966 and the dedication of the commemorative plaque in May of 19 or 2014. Kurt excelled in every aspect of his life. He's a top scholar, top athlete, hard worker dedicated to his family, dedicated to his business, dedicated to his church, dedicated to the principle that a top-notch education system it was a top priority in our community. One of his many achievements was an instrumental role in the establishment of the educational complex and new 1960 at that time high school era school. Unfortunately, <coughs> Kurt left us at the age of 30 after achieving so much in so little time. On October 14th, 1966, 
the community named the state-of-the-art athletic complex in honor of Kurt. There was a short ceremony during the halftime of the Verona Milton football game. A program was prepared by the Board of Education with a tribute to Kurt. The program also included some folks familiar to us in this room. It's interesting note to note that Lloyd Hornbacher was a principal when this, when this event occurred. In my research, some, of the, some in the archives of the Verona Press, I found that the ceremony was brief, but appropriate, heartfelt. In discussions with Jackie, she mentioned that Kurt's dad, Mr. Jones, to all of us who were educated under his tutelage, made a few remarks and introduced his family. Please take a moment to look at this picture of the Jones family at the event. If you think this was not a memorable, memorable event for the Jones family, you are wrong. When Phil, Laura, and I were discussing our approach for today, we all felt we would be remiss if we did not recognize Mr. Jones and his entire family and their role in this community. As luck would have it, I found that the Jones and Roethlisberger families were very close. And over many years, Phil has a wealth of information about their support of our community. Phil will also discuss Kurt's role in acquiring the land for the education complex as it stands today, again disregarding the building out on the west side of the city. One final item before Phil begins. Phil and Mr. Jones have a unique relationship. <laughs> Phil had, and still has, a mischievous streak in it that sometimes stretched the patience of Mr. Jones. I'm quite sure that when the old high school was finally retired, Phil held the record for the most minor disciplinary visits to Mr. Jones' office over the approximately 25 years of Mr. Jones' tenure in Verona. So on that light, Phil. <laughs> Thank you, Will. Uh, I'm going to stand up so you can see it. You will have to forgive my sweatshirt. It was a gift from my two Verona grandchildren. But I assure you, I'm one of the Indians for the rest of my life. <laughs> contribution today should be titled Verona High School History 101. <laughs> A summary of the Jones family and their 29 years of service to our community. During our house high school years, Mr. Jones was known as Bert to the students but you better never let him hear you say it. Or you would be in deep trouble. <laughs> I want to go into the 29 years and the similarities of my family and the Albert Jones family. A span of 29 years. My parents moved to the Verona area in 1920. Mr. and Mrs. Jones arrived in Verona in 1923. Mr. Jones was born in Bridgeport, Wisconsin and was valedictorian of the 
1915 Prairie du Chien High School class. His training was at La Crosse Normal School, was interrupted by World War I, in which he served his country overseas with the Navy. After the war, he finished lacrosse normal in 1921. After receiving teaching at several schools in the state, received his bachelor's degree in 1931 and his master's from the University of Wisconsin in 1933. For several years, Mr. Jones was principal, athletic director, and teacher, all at the same time. During World War II, he coached all sports, taught three classes in physical education, taught mathematics and science, and served as principal. He was married to Dorothy Govier in 1922, and together they raised four children. In 1936, both families, mine and the Joneses, each lost a child. My sister June and their daughter Shirley are both laid to rest in cemetery plots side by side I being only four, I can still remember it. My sister Doris was added to our family in 1923. And Albert Jones, Jr. was born into the Jones family in 1924. And eventually became the second valedictorian in the Jones family. My sister Ruth joined our family in 1925, and their son Bruce joined the Jones family in 1929. Bruce, John Cher, Delbert Blaisdell, and myself had a barbershop quartet and performed for the early Verona varieties. A forerunner of the Verona Area Community Theater. At this time, Kurt and the rest of his classmates joined this world, 1932, in the midst of the Depression. And the third valedictorian in the Jones family was born. And last but not least, Diane joined the family in 1939. So many families have been touched by this family. I can't help but wonder how many students Mr. Jones graduated. In our class of 1950, we had one graduate, Ken Wiesenberg, whose mother graduated under Mr. Jones. In addition, my Laura and three of her brothers graduated in 1949, 1951, <coughs> and 1952. Mr. Jones's last graduating class. Now a personal note of my years at Verona High School. I was not your greatest student. <laughs> Certainly not a candidate for valedictorian. I can well remember one of the conferences I had with Mr. Jones in the school's office. He stated, Phil, you're a hell of a 
<laughs> what am I ever going to do with you? <laughs> but I went on, I finished the course, receiving a signed diploma. <laughs> I remember very well Mr. Jones handing me my diploma, shaking my hand and saying, well, Bill, we made it. <laughs> <laughs> There were years I had so many detentions that I couldn't get them completed. It was just like a pardon from the governor. I remember so well the school cleaning lady, Mrs. McGilver. We became very close friends. <laughs> Under Mr. Jones' guidance, education at Verona High School developed in a series of steps, including a large addition to the building in 1937, development of the band, an addition of a full-time band director, Addition of agricultural course in 1947. Yeah. Building of an agricultural shop in 1950. An enlargement of the home economics department in 1947. Besides his 29 years of service to Verona High School, Mr. Jones served on many regional and statewide boards and committees. Mr. Jones was active in many <coughs> civic and professional organizations, and much credit belonged to Mr. Jones for the high ideals and leadership he displayed in the profession. He was also a charter member of the American Legion Post, served as its commanding officer, adjutant, and finance officer. He was a president of the Verona Chamber of Commerce and a member of the Verona Fire Department. Mr. Jones served well in the educational field and the community. A newspaper clipping from the Verona Library records the following. The evening of May the 29th, 1952, more than 350 alumni, faculty members, and friends gathered in the Verona High School gym to attend a testimonial dinner for retiring principal and Mrs. Jones. It was noted, this is really something, that Bill Roethlisberger <laughs> sang two songs. <laughs> Nobody knows the trouble I've seen. <laughs> and may the good Lord bless and keep <laughs> Now about Kirk. Maybe his dad was principal. He did not get a free ride, I can assure you. If anything, he had to work harder to get what he received. I call that character building. And it served Kirk very well. In a few years, when at the age of 26, he would be elected to the Verona High School Board of Education. He wasn't stuffy. He was one of us. A great athlete, a great student, and how he did it all, he still found time to work at the filling station that he eventually owned.
I remember very well his first car. I can't recall what it was, or what year, or what make it was. As I recall, it was a dull gray, or a faded black. <laughs> in, their in those days, there was a salvage yard at the corner of Regent and West Washington Avenue in Madison called Paley Brothers. From that day on, Kurt was Paley Jones. <laughs> I imagine that, Jackie, you had a lot of rides in that car. <laughs> now some history of some of the problems Kurt and the Board of Education encountered. First of all, in the 50s and early 60s, the State Department of Public Instruction was promoting the consolidation of country schools at the time Verona was surrounded by seven or eight one-room schools. This didn't set well with the rural people, mostly the farmers. It meant the end of our three-person three school boards, of mother's clubs, Christmas program at the school, Santa Claus, last day of school picnic, <coughs> and our 4-H clubs. Just a lot of country to give it to get us. The school was the backbone of our rural community. <clears throat> this didn't set well with the people. Also, the need arose for a new high school. where to build it. On a hot, humid August evening in a gym filled with people, Kurt and the rest of the board proposed that we purchase 40 acres of land on which to build a new high school. A lot of the farmers, including myself, Couldn't see why we needed 40 acres <laughs> when five would have done. <laughs> but we voted. We lost. The 40 acres was purchased. A new high school was built and occupied. And in 1964, we consolidated to K-12. Today, we are in the process of building the third high school on at least 160 acres. <laughs> and already there's a concern it will be too small. <laughs> you tell me, who had the vision? It was Kurt Jones. Well, I don't know how in the hell I'm going to follow that. <laughs> oh, that was great, Phil. You know, that's been long overdue to recognize the Jones family. It really is. I know there's so many of us that can owe a great portion of our success in life to what uh, Bert Jones did for us. And I know I certainly can. Thank you, Phil. Thank you. Okay, continuing. Um, Jackie and, their family, and her family left Verona, eventually settled in Virginia. Now, we want to move forward to 2012. Uh, Dennis Barris, president of the school board, and friend of Laureline and her family, mentioned there was some rumbling about renaming Kurt Jones Field 
since no one seemed to know or remember who Kurt Jones was. Well, Laureline felt that was terribly wrong, and during a discussion at one of our class reunions, said that we must do something to preserve Kurt's legacy. Uh, we all agreed, thought that was a wonderful idea, but absolutely Zippo was done. We did nothing. Now, being the persistent type, in the next class reunion, she brought it up again. And at that point, we kind of got together and said we needed to do something. Uh, we recognized that it would be a fair amount of work. It would require some funding. It would require a financial commitment from all of our classmates. At one point, we thought about opening the fundraising out to the community, but then we brought it back in and said, hey, if we can't do it, it won't be done. So again, the funding was provided by the members of the class of 1950. As I was presenting this, my thoughts on fundraising at the class reunion, my good, long time friend, Russell Tollefson. He owns half of Exeter Township, some of my <laughs> pros, you know, <laughs> it, you know it's, it's something to behold. But anyhow, while I'm up there kind of talking about it a little bit, he leans over and says to me in a voice loud enough for people to hear, but yet quietly, he says, I'll kick in 500 bucks if you'll match it. So with that, our fundraising effort was underway. Thank you, Russell. I appreciate you. Um, we formed a planning committee. Me, Dennis Barris, Orlean, Russell, Phil, and I got to include Laura, and Ed Brooks. We settled on a plaque to be displayed on the athletic complex. We worked hard on the terminology and then presented the idea to Jen. She agreed wholeheartedly. We set the date, got stuff done, and we were ready for the presentation in May of 2014. Lots of work, lots of discussion, lots of food at the draft house. <laughs> One bit of knowledge I gained. I now know how hard it is to herd cats. <laughs> Phil, Laureline, Russell, Ed Rose, know more people, remember more stuff, that had more life experiences than the law allows and it doesn't take <clears throat> much to set it on, but it was a great experience. The day before the event, Jackie and her family arrived, and we met for the first time. Great family, vibrant, great conversationalists, fun to be around. We broke the ice at Delaney's the night before, on Friday night. We talked much too long with the dining room staff, and they were hinting very broadly, but sometimes pointedly, that we should get the hell out of there and go in the bar. <laughs> That's okay. Friday morning arrived. It was a bright, beautiful day. We met at the complex and got underway. Dennis opened the gathering. We faced the flag, and Lorling's daughter, Renata, gave a magnificent rendition of her national anthem. I would say that that was really small town America in action. Dennis, as I said, opened the, the uh, proceedings. Phil and I gave our thoughts. Dave Richardson, the football coach, gave a short acknowledgement and remarked that he too often wondered who Kurt Jones was. But after hearing Kurt's history, he would ensure that the players would also begin to know 
and appreciate Kurt's legacy. Part of me understands why there was a question about why the field was named after Kurt. Put the situation in perspective, all that we have discussed and will discuss today concerning Kurt and his achievements, the honor of naming the field in his honor occurred 40 to 60 years ago prior to the parents of the current students being born. And that like the questions are understandable. Today, Verona is a city of approximately 13,000 people, an urban community with a large percentage of our residents employed in various occupations in the greater metro area. Our city is home to many manufacturing <clears throat> and service organizations and will continue to grow. The impact of ethic will continue to be a factor in the growth of our community. Our school system is one of the largest in the area and we marvel at the structure growing on our <coughs> side. Now, I know some of us can and some of us can't. I'd like us to turn our mental clock back to 1946. That was the year our class entered high school. Verona was a village of 597 people, plus or minus some people will question that. The high school had just over 100 students. Verona had two feed mills, three or four taverns. One six lane bowling alley, three grocery stores, four churches, three service stations, one car dealership, farm implement store, a railroad depot lumber yard, blacksmith shop, the famous Eagle's Nest restaurant, and three Friday night outdoor movies at the Auditorium Hotel. So that was Verona. The village served surrounding agricultural community and the agricultural community depended upon the service the village provided. The community and the nation was recovering from the effects of World War II. That was a tough time for all of us, as we remember. It was in this environment that our class entered our freshman year at Verona High School. We came from the one-room schools Phil mentioned scattered around the school districts. In Pearson, White, Valley View, Andrew Henry, Gordon Maple Grove, and Maple Corners, and of course, Road Gray School. Our students, we were, in the main, strangers to one another at first day of school. It was a big event, I think for all of us. It was, it was a significant thing to come out of grade school one room schools and come into this huge metropolis and meet all the people who came to high school. <laughs> For me, the first time I'd been in school wearing something other than bib overalls. My dad, he doubled as a barber. He had given me a fresh bowl cup. And I, along with a lot of the other farm kids, were wearing a hint of Holstein clothes. <laughs> so I and other freshmen were ready to go. Mr. Jones, our longtime principal, and I come to the community, recognized me during the first assembly as the outstanding graduate of McPherson graded school. <laughs> then he tempered that distinguishing feat by knowing that I was the only graduate. <laughs> uh, not long after that, I discovered Kurt. Good looking to a fault, perfect hair, well dressed, <laughs> losing confidence. He had the build of an athlete, and rumor had it that he was also out of the top academically. It was at this point I suspected that all men, that the all men are created so, must have a few exceptions. But that some people are more equal than others. As time went on, all that turned out to be true. Kurt proved to be a natural leader, was very intelligent, rose to the top academically, and stayed there. He went out for all sports offered, including boxing, 
basketball, football, under the tutelage of a rather quiet, gentle soul, our coach, Harry Scott, and he being our all sports coach. Between our sophomore and junior year, a new coach arrived. Mr. Frank was a World War II vet. I hear that he was a survivor of the Pearl Harbor attack. He was a rather forceful coach with a demeanor that got your attention. Winning and working with winners was the way he wanted to operate. I think he had an eye on Kirk from the beginning and recognized his potential early on. The first year under Mr. Frank, our football program was six-man football. This was an abomination for Mr. Frank. He did, it, he did his best to get through that season, but the vow that the following year Verona would be playing real football. When basketball season arrived, Kurt started with four seniors, Leo Sweeney, who would have been here today, but he had a little problem, fell on the ice, John Cher, Bill Schutz, and Tom Mann. They had a great year, and Kurt, playing what we now call the point guard position, weathered some rather memorable teaching moments in the small confines of the old gym. Rumor has it, some of the more devout in the audience felt it necessary to retreat to the distant seats when hearing the content of the teaching moments. <laughs> but Coach Frank was a caring person, respected Kurt, and wanted the best out of him, and Kurt understood. Just getting there sometimes was a little bit unnerving. But the end result was a very good basketball game. They won 16 straight. Is that right, John? When football season arrived and practice began, Coach Frank needed something like 25% of the total enrollment of Verona High School to field a team. He was the only coach, of course, and he had to keep 25 or better players in some semblance of order, but with the help of his able assistant, Phil. <laughs> with a bit of bluster, he did get Kirk was quickly established as a starting quarterback, all the plays, and the team did amazingly well, losing the two games, as I recall. <coughs> Side note on Coach Frank, he is a member of the Wisconsin High School Coaches Hall of Fame. As it was for most of us, for Kirk, it wasn't all work and no play. In the midst of all this, Kirk managed to kind of ventured north to the den of our tribal Middleton and met a young lady named Jackie Ockenberg. <clears throat> it was apparent from Kurt, Kurt's point of view, the search was over. All that was left was the courtship stuff. After graduation, Kurt enrolled in the UW College of Engineering and joined the Naval ROTC. As expected, he did very well. At some point, his priorities changed. I think Kurt had an internal clock that was running a bit faster than that of the rest of us, and he may have known it. He left college, went into business in Verona. He and Jackie married, and children followed. He quickly established himself as a solid businessman, ran a very successful service organization right in the heart of the community. Kurt soon became involved in the effort to improve the secondary school system, and at the age of 25, 26 or so, found himself on the Board of Education. And again, Phil has covered that so well. <coughs> he was given the task of acquiring the land for the education and complex, and it was not an easy task, but the job got done. It was not an easy, as I said, not an easy task. The cornerstone for the new high school was laid in 1960. Some of you might recognize it. 
Mr. Henry Maurer, Paul McClellan, and the other two I don't know. If anybody knows who they are, please say something. Yes. I think Art Sloan is in the right. Yep, it is. Art. Okay. And the other one? Did you say his name was an Art Sloan? Oh, uh, um, uh, SLO. Olson. Um, Gilmer Olson on the left. Um, again, Prince served well, was highly regarded by the board members, and as you can see, some of them nearly twice his age. First dedication to the community was broad. Jackie, who is one of our communications, told me they were active in the Salem Reformed Church. And Kirk taught Sunday school as well. When the church decided a new facility was needed, Kurt became actively involved in the fundraising effort, in the successful fundraising effort for the church that's now the United Church of Christ on the west side of Roma. Jackie, Jackie commented at one time that Kurt did not have the chance to attend the church when it was completed. The October 14th, 1966 ceremony <clears throat> dedicating the new athletic complex of Kurt's honor as testimony to the respect the community held for Kurt. I'm in awe of what Kurt accomplished in his time in this world. Although he was with us for only 30 years, <clears throat> Kurt left a legacy of devotion to family, dedication to education and community service that is the model for us all and generations to follow. I hope our efforts have given the community, the faculty, the coaches, the students and athletes that compete on Kurt Jones Field have a better understanding of why it is so named. Jackie, we will always consider you and your family, valued members of this community. Always be proud. Kurt will all be remembered. Phil, you have something. Yeah. We found this memorial to Kurt at the, at the library. Okay. It's entitled The Spirit of Kurt Jones. Our community lost a truly outstanding young man last week, but it was not just Verona's loss. For Curtis Jones was also a citizen of Dane County, of Wisconsin, of the whole country, in the finest sense of the word. And his sense of duty, of business ethic, of civic responsibility, and community betterment was indeed remarkable in this day and age. Some would point to his business success, and he did develop a fine service establishment in a highly competitive industry before the age of 30. Others would remember him for his wonderful family and fraternal life, doing the things he truly loved to do and doing them so well. But most of us prefer to think of Kurt as a builder of schools and churches, not a contractor, mind you, but a real spark plug that ignited the community engine and got it rolling in the right direction. Then when he saw that the current project was underway, he'd quietly withdraw and look for other community problems in need of a solution. 
it's always a great pity to see young people struck down so early in life, particularly good young men of Kurt's caliber, but his contributions to the community, the schools, and the church, all before the age of 30, were somewhat greater than most of us might claim in an average lifespan of three score and more. But Kurt would not want no tears, so let's keep his memory by keeping the lamp of progress which he helped to ignite, burning ever more brightly. And above all, let's encourage future Kurt Joneses, both young and old, as they strive to make the world a better place in which to live, both now and in the future. For the spirit of genuine progress is needed more than ever before. You know, when we talk about this subject and we, we talk about Kurt Grant, I get a little emotional about it. Um, but it's not a sad thing. I think it's important for us to all to know that we are so lucky and we should, should be so joyful that we had Kurt Jones, the, Kurt, the family of Kurt Jones, Jackie, her family, as a part of our community for so long. And I think that's the way we need to look at it. it it's a great blessing that we have had the experience of the Jones family and in particular, Kurt Jones. Now, I know that you all got things you want to talk about, questions you want to ask, or comments you want to make. <coughs> if anyone's brave enough, we were hoping maybe some other folks might share a couple memories too, since there's so many people who knew Kurt. It's a great chance to, to get him out there and record it. Anyone want to ask something? Yeah, Randy. Briefly, I, I think I remember you got the I remember the time when uh, I came in 65, and shortly thereafter, uh, they had this the field named after Kurt, and then there was a big sign on the football field uh, with, with his name on it. It stood for many, many years, and finally, I think the wood just rotted away, and they took the sign down and never really replaced it with an upgraded, and in that period of time, people just kind of forgot that this field was named after Kurt and then uh, in 2014 with the group getting together and buying that plaque which now stands on the, uh, right, ne right next to the field it kind of got rejuvenated a little bit I think uh, in our hallway up there we have a kind of a Hall of Fame board which I think it would really be nice to have uh, this photo on there plus the one uh, with the uh, 1950 basketball team that was shown here so that that can remain when that gets taken to the new school that these <coughs> memories about Kurt and about other teams he was on and so forth will be kind of locked in there for the ages, hopefully. Yeah. Sounds like we got a project for the historical society. Awesome. <laughs> you know, we also want to share some memories or, or thoughts or say a couple words or questions about what it was like to be in, in Vermont High back in 1950. I, I just want to say the one thing about Kurt was you would never know he was the principal's son because we never ever, you know, in any, in any way treated him any different and he never acted like he was who he was, <laughs> you know. Some people would take advantage of things like that, but no, he never, never, yeah. It was always easy to get along with everybody. Yeah. <coughs> so. You know, I, I comment on what you said. Uh, I think that's a great effort. Uh, I made a, I made a little bit of a, let's see, a small effort to try to get that type of information somewhere in the school system as a part of the display. And. I, I really didn't meet with any success on that. So, um, a good idea, and if you can get it done, great too. Okay.
Oh, oh yeah. I, I'm yeah. just curious that Phil knew who wrote that memorial that, uh, statement. I don't think there was any. There, there are initials on the bottom. Attached to it. <clears throat> I can tell you. I'll give you the initials. Oh, okay. <clears throat> There's three, like WJW or something like that. Oh, okay. Laura, can you explain where this wonderful uh, framed photograph up here came from? Because that is an interesting, interesting story. Imagine that. Where were those? Um, years ago. I remember in the 1937 high school over on Marietta Street that the walls were lined with each graduating class, just like that. The DeLong Studio did all of our portraits. There would be a day set aside that the seniors would make appointments and go have their picture taken. And then a photo like that would be a gift to the school from the um, photographer. Anyway, they lined photos way before that. Phil remembers his sister from earlier classes. All those pictures were lining the walls. But when they demolished the Marietta Street High School, um, those photos were going to be destroyed. And luckily, Richard Tollison retrieved as many as he could. And then gave them out to uh, the yeah, students Lord, that were pictured. And this is Richard's class. And Richard passed away a year ago. And um, his wife and family have donated this picture to the Verona Historical Society. Uh, if you don't mind, I'd just like to say something about uh, my relationship with Kurt. Uh, growing up in Verona, I spent a lot of time at uh, Jones House, and uh, uh, they were always a welcoming family, and uh, that was up on the south end of town, and I was downtown, so it was a bit of a trip. But uh, Kurt and I became very close friends over the years. Kurt was in my wedding, and, uh, and, and I agree uh, that Kurt was a prominent businessman in Verona. And, uh, and I do recall his efforts with the uh, high school. Uh, <clears throat> I didn't get uh, involved too much. I was on the grade school board, the Verona grade school board at the time that the consolidation was looming. And I was smart enough to get off the board before it all happened. <laughs> Uh, the number of phone calls I got uh, uh, in the in the beginning of the consolidation told me that th this was not a job that, uh, that I was going to like very much. So I really have to give a lot of credit to uh, to Kurt for for being part of that, and uh, because it wasn't uh, it wasn't a lot of fun. Guys like Phil uh, and other farmers and pe people in the rural community. Didn't want to give up, as Phil indicated, and uh, and it was very apparent. They didn't want to give up their school. They didn't want to give up their community, and uh, I could understand that. But uh, it was progress at that time. The uh, whole state was going that way, so it wasn't going to stop. But Kurt's efforts uh, are uh, definitely something to be recognized and and uh, kept historically. Uh, he was, uh, as you both indicated, uh, a most uh, fine gentleman, and uh, uh, he was a smart guy. Uh, I don't mean smart by smart. He was a very intelligent guy, and I knew what he was about, and uh, everything he worked on uh, turned out well. So I just want to mention that because uh, um, I, uh, I do remember Kurt. I... Uh, uh, well, not forget Kurt, uh, as a matter of fact, as one of my uh, longtime friends. And uh, it was great to see uh, uh, Jackie here and uh, to be part of this program today. You guys both did a very nice job of commemorating this yeah. whole thing.
Well, I definitely want to get a picture. Anyone who was in this picture or in the school around this time has to come up before anyone leaves. And we get all your guys' picture together. Um, what's cool is Andy is filming this. I can just imagine like 30 years from now, some high school student is going to Google, who is Curtis Jones? And they're going to find this hour and be like, oh my god, I had no idea, which is, which is the real gift you guys have given everyone. And, and last thing, um, Phil, you have to tell us, where did you get this brand new looking Verona um, sweater there? What is the story with that? And will you model it for us? <laughs> this would have been in, uh, that, that sweater is, I would say, 70 years old. Still in good condition. Uh, Harry Scott, our first coach when we were freshmen and sophomores. Uh, before Verona, he was coached at, who's that on the? Oh, um, it says Hillsborough, Wisconsin. Hillsborough, Hillsborough. Yeah. Hillsborough Oak Warren Mills. And he right away immediately started prom pro promoting letter sweaters from Hillsborough. And it took on. I mean, every, everybody had them. And that letter, that letter on there, I earned as manager. It's got the M on there, and there's no way to get it on. Uh, no, I, I want to... Will was talking about Coach Frank. And, uh, yeah, he got excited. And of course, to be manager, I usually sat right beside him. We were up in Middleton one night, and he was, things got hot, didn't like what the officials were, were doing, and he was, he was, and the crowd was on the bench, we were, we were sitting right, right directly behind us. And uh, some call or something, he was sitting like this with this wet, sweat laden <laughs> towel in his hands, and he suddenly threw it up over his back and slapped this poor woman right <laughs> in the And she proceeded to give him a beating with her purse. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you, I truly earned that letter. <laughs> I beside it. That's all I've got. <laughs> we, have, we got all during this process. Why, Laureline, of course, was an integral part of it. And so when we were discussing a presentation, why I always said, hey, Laureline, you gotta, you got to wear your cheerleader outfit from when you were a cheerleader. <laughs> yeah, well, there's Almost got her convinced, but she brought it home today. You have my cheerleading skirt. Any other questions or comments from anyone or thoughts? Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> it's just a shit. Oh, it's got the red light. Just talk really loud. Oh, 
All I want to know is, was it the same Coach Frank that came yes. back in yeah. the 60s yes. when we were there? Yeah. 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 That was the same. Wow. Yeah, okay. he, he didn't get any mellower. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's what I, I just thought so, but I wasn't sure. Yeah. So. Uh, yeah. I mean, actually, well, you might have your mic. Andy, we'll cut this part out of the so. On table access, it'll just magically appear in your hand. Test one, two. I, I have uh, one question to ask, uh, maybe Phil, the 40-acre farm, or was it a 40-acre farm that was purchased, knowing how sensitive farmers were at that time? Or who owned that property that was acquired? Any recollection? Is Hank Niglis. Oh, that was Hank? Okay. <coughs> God, they owned quite a bit back then, didn't they? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, they bought they bought half of the eighty acres, and then later the school district acquired the other, the rest of it, or most of other than the condos that are at the in the well house that are at the top of the hill. Okay. So uh, I'll just say a few things that I've learned today. Uh, uh, my name's Dave Polda. My dad's Ray Polda. He's in the picture of the fire uh, department there next to Curtis. I think that picture is nineteen fifty eight. Um, Interesting, during your talk, you mentioned how Mr. Jones was on the fire department. I honestly didn't know that, and I'm kind of the historian to some degree with Don Stewart when he was around. I do know the fire department started because of one of the grade schools uh, had a fire, I think it was 1922 or thereabouts. So that was nice to learn that. Um, I like to compliment uh, the family quite a bit. I've always wondered about Mr. Jones, the principal. I knew something about Curtis because of Dad a little bit. Uh, I knew he drove the FWD. He was probably one of the best drivers of the FWD, uh, which was a touchy vehicle to drive for the fire department. I'll say this, uh, Bruce Jones, uh, his little brother, was a, a good man in the community, too. Um, he was our Cub Scout, I'm sorry, Boy Scout officer, and uh, led quite a few trips for the kids. So the Jones family was definitely very instrumental. Um, I will say this about Coach Frank, and uh, I'm interested in if John, and maybe he didn't have to put up with this John Shear, but some of us uh, ended up marrying our high school sweethearts, I know John did, I did Jane Whiting, my wife, um, and uh, I just remember coaches jumping on a couple of us at times and bringing our uh, girlfriends into play as to having them in front of football every once in a while, so I know the coach was, uh, was a pretty strong taskmaster, I'll say that. This is in 74, uh, but we all appreciated Coach Frank. Um, we need to even talk about him, and I was going to bring that up that I, I had heard he left the community for a while and then came back, and uh, I don't know when he ultimately retired, I think in the 90s, but uh, he was a good good guy. Taskmaster, though, but like I said, he did ride some of us uh, having girlfriends while we were in school. So I'll leave it at that, but uh, I was curious about, I always wondered about the acreage, who owned that, and I didn't realize Nicholas owned that, too. So thanks a lot. I greatly enjoyed this. I would look forward to the fighter discussion, too, oh, while that time comes. There we go. There we go. What do you think, Will? Fighters. Well, I didn't hear that. Oh, he said he's looking forward to your fighter jet presentation. Oh, my God. We're booking in June right now, if you're free. <laughs> Give him some time to get the nerves down for this one. Anyone else like to say anything? Don't be shy. Oh, oh over there. No, I just yeah. want to say thank you. Oh, thank, thank you, you everybody. I just want to say thank you. That's all. Thank you. And, and sorry, my kids aren't here. Come on. I'm sorry my kids weren't here. They would have just taken this all in so, you know, to their hearts. But I'll tell them. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you all. graduated from high school, I was, as were many other young men, 1A in the draft. And the Korean War was, was in progress, and so we were certain that we were going to be drafted. And so I stayed, I didn't do anything for a year. 
I was kind of floundering around. I was driving a truck. Fellows and I and Tim Weisberg took a long trip. We did a lot of things. And so a year passed. And my dad and Bert Jones were members, I think, of kind of a, like a card club, I think. And so my dad, Mr. Jones, had a card, a card meeting. And the next morning, I get up, and my dad's standing there, and he's telling me, Bert Jones is going to stop by in about an hour. Here's a check for a hundred bucks. He's going to take you in and get you registered at the University of Wisconsin. And the registration had already been completed. He walked me through all these things, and I was in class the following Monday. That led to a degree. That led to me being a pilot. That led to me being sent overseas. I met my wife overseas, my two sons, and I attribute it all to Mr. Jones. So again, he's, <clears throat> he's very important man in my life. That's all I have. Thank you. Great. Thank you.